the United States gets 84% of its total energy from oil, coal, and natural gases, all of which are fossil fuels. We depend on fossil fuels to heat our homes, run our vehicles, power industries for manufacturing, and provide us with electricity. Fossil fuels are an incredibly dense form of energy that took millions of years to become so, and when they're gone, they're gone for good. This is one of the many reasons why the United States government should increase its development of the Earth's moon in the following area, energy. What's the problem with the way we are using fossil fuels now? We will eventually run out. If you were to look at the U.S. Energy Information Administration, global primary energy consumption for the year 2006 was made up as follows. Oil, 36.54% gas 22.98%, coal 27.18%, hydroelectric 6.37%, nuclear power 5.92%, and wind, solar energy, and wood 1.02%, bringing us to a total of 100%. Yes, these numbers may have changed some since 2006, but it is a sufficient example of how we rely a huge amount on gas, oil, and coal for most of our energy. If we were to consume all of our fossil fuels, like I will explain next, we would have to rely solemnly on solar energy and wind. And with roughly only 2% of energy coming from that now, we would quickly run out of enough energy to power the US. The problem is not going to fix itself. According to the website Ecotricity, who initially referenced the CIA World Factbook, estimated in 2012 globally every year we consume the equivalent of over 11 billion tons of oil and fossil fuels. Crude oil reserves are vanishing at the rate of 4 billion tons a year. If we carry on at this rate, without taking into consideration any increase for our growing population, our known oil deposits will be gone by 2050. We will still have gas left and coal too. But if we increase gas production in order to fill the energy gap left by oil, then those reserves will give us an additional eight years, taking us to roughly 2060. But the rate at which the world consumes fossil fuels is not standing still. It is increasing as the world's population increases, and as living standards rise, especially in parts of the world that until recently had consumed very little energy. Fossil fuels will therefore run out even earlier. It's often claimed that we have enough coal to last us hundreds of years. But if we step up production to fill the gap left through depleting oil and gas reserves, the coal deposits we know about will only give us enough energy to take us as far as 2088. Not to mention the carbon dioxide emissions from burning all that coal will drastically decrease our way of life. So how do we plan to avoid the inevitable? We should be mining the moon for what is known as helium-3 and use it as an alter alternative to burning fossil fuels for energy here on Earth, specifically in the United States. Helium-3 is not even found on Earth because it cannot survive our environment, but according to the website Popular Mechanics in the article titled Mining the Moon produced in 2016, digging a patch of lunar surface, roughly three quarters of a square mile, to the depth of about nine feet should yield about 220 pounds of helium-3, enough to power a city the size of Dallas or Detroit for a year although considerable lunar soil will, would have to be produced in order to power all 50 states, the mining costs would not be high by terrestrial standards. Automated machines will perform the work in extracting the isotope, which would not be particularly difficult either. Fusion power plants on the moon operating on deuterium and helium-3 would offer lower capital and operating costs than their competitors. Not to mention the absence of radioactive fuel, no air or water pollution, and only low-level radioactive waste disposal requirements. Recent estimates suggest that about $6 billion in investment capital will be required to develop and construct the first helium-3 fusion power plant. Financial break-even at today's wholesale electricity prices is about $0.05 cents per kilowatt per hour, which would occur after five 1,000 megawatt plants were online, replacing old conventional plants and meeting new demand. As for our right to use what the moon has to offer here in the U.S., on May 31st in 2008, Glenn Harlan Reynolds, in an article titled, Who Owns the Moon? The Case for Lunar Property, 
In Maritime Salvage Law, which also deals with property rights beyond national territory, actually being there is key. Those who reach a wreck first and secure the property are generally entitled to a percentage of what they recover. Even There's even some case law allowing the presence of, to be robotic rather than human. In the 1980 Deep Seabed Hard Mineral Res Resources Act, the United States recognized deep sea mining rights outside its own territory without claiming sovereignty over the seabed. There's nothing to stop Congress from passing a similar law or act relating to the moon. So, in conclusion, the United States government should increase its development of the Earth's moon for energy.